you find this in John 1, verses 1 to 13, where we'll be looking at today. Let's bow our heads and pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning as we look into your word, Lord, we ask you, you would give us the words. Help us to declare your word, declare who you are. Lord, we also ask that the ears would be hearing, the eyes would be open, and the hearts be soft. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit be among us as we look into his word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Starting at the New Testament, it starts with the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they are known as Sethmatic. The word Sethmatic is to see together. Here in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, look at the life of Jesus Christ in a more chronological order. It's not quite the thematic, but it's more chronological. And they cover more as the biography of Jesus, <coughs> but John's gospel is altogether different than these first three Gospels. We basically have Christ presented in Matthew as, Behold your king. If you haven't seen that, it's important that Matthew has a Jewish focus and emphasis. Matthew is basically saying, Behold your king. And through the Gospel of Matthew, you find a repeated phrase that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, so Matthew goes back to the Old Testament and helps us see that Jesus is the, the promised Messiah. Now the Gospel of Mark focuses more on the Roman mind and culture. The Gospel of Mark says, Behold a servant, writing to the Roman mind and culture of the time. And the key word there is immediately or straightway. Now in Luke's Gospel, he says, Behold the man. So Matthew says, Behold the king, Mark says, Behold the servant, and Luke says, Behold the man. And Luke's emphasis is to the Greek, to the Greek mind or Greek culture. And now as we come to John's gospel, <clears throat> basically John says, Behold your God. And that's the theme that will be running through our series through this gospel of John. Now John's gospel isn't written specifically to the Jewish, Roman, or the Greek mind. It's actually inclusive or universal. We have John 3.16, and that's on our sign out here, and it's been out there for a little bit of time out there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So here are some key words you understand, the Gospel of John. They are signs, belief, and life. Now, signs speak of the fact of something that is a revelation of God. We'll be looking at the seven miracles in the Gospel of John called signs. They are called signs because they are pointing to something, and they point to the deity of Christ. The word believe is the reaction that ought to be invoked from the result of seeing the sign or the miracle. So first the miracle, then the response is either belief or disbelief. The third key word, life, is the result of that belief that you have in the revelation of God. So there is God revealed in the signs, and then the reaction of belief and trusting that Jesus is the Son of God. And the result is that it brings eternal life. There's also another combination of words, life and light. In John 20, 30 to 31, John tells us why he wrote his gospel. In verse 30, And many other signs truly that Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So this is why John wrote this book. You have the signs, the belief, 
and the like. Now, there are many, many miracles recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they record a lot of the same miracles that aren't recorded for us in the Gospel of John. I find it interesting that the Gospel of John is basically laid out around seven miracles. And now some add an eighth miracle at his resurrection, being to catch a fish, filling the nets on the Sea of Galilee, John 21. But it's really seven miracles. The first one, turning the water into wine. I think we all remember that one. And the next one is the healing of the nobleman's son, the healing of the impotent man, feeding the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water, and John 9, the healing of the blind man, John 11, and we'll be speaking about this more later, not this week, I don't think, raising Lazarus from the dead. There are only two miracles of these seven that are recorded in the other gospel. Isn't that amazing? The feeding of the 5,000 and when Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee. It's interesting that the feeding of the 5,000 is actually in all four of the gospels. I like what Graham Scroggie says in his introduction to the Bible. He says the moment we pick up John's gospel, we are aware that it's different from the others. There's no genealogy. There's no manger scene. There's no boyhood. There's no baptism. There's no temptation. And no Mount Transfiguration. There's no Gethsemane. And only some special miracles chosen by John as signs. We have the great I Am sayings of Jesus and many discourses found nowhere else in the gospel. Of John has been in the gospel. John has been called the most profound book ever written. It doesn't have any miracles or any parables. Excuse me, any parables is what I meant to say there. But it does have allegories. There are many other facets and features that are unique to John's gospel. But notice, I read the verse to you before. It is also an attested gospel. As we read in John 20, 30, I'll read it again. It says that these miracles were done in the presence of his disciples. They saw these miracles, and they're attesting to the fact that they did take place. <coughs> Excuse me. Here in John 1, 1 to 13, we have some deep theology, so we need to put on our thinking caps and follow along. In the first 13 verses, we have the prologue, and I want to break it into sections for us. In verses 1 to 2, we have the Word and God. In the beginning was the Word. Here's the theme through these verses, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Also reading verses 3 to 5, all things were made by him. And this is amazing for some of us, maybe. And without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Or it didn't take it in, or it didn't understand it, or comprehend it, or could not extinguish that light. Now going back to verse 1 with the meaning of the word, word. In the beginning was the word. Word here in the Greek word is logos. It was used by the Greeks, by Philo and the Greek philosophers and has two basic meanings. It has the idea of reason and thought and the idea of communication. In the beginning was the word. is a reference to Jesus Christ. John used these wonderful, this wonderful term to describe Jesus. He calls him the Word. I believe that when John says that he, Jesus, was the Word, he's saying that Jesus Christ came to reveal God to us. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in different, diverse or different manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2 hath in these last days spoken unto us by and in and through his Son. So how does God speak? 
in the person of Jesus Christ. If you want to hear God, we have to look and listen to Jesus. We have to look at him and listen to him. If we are wrong about Jesus, we are wrong about God. And if we don't have Jesus, then we don't have God. God is speaking. This is the doctrine of revelation, and God can't be known apart from the revelation because God is transcendent and beyond our comprehension. So God has to condescend to us to speak to us. How does God speak? He speaks in creation. He speaks to us and in our conscience. And he speaks clearly and loudly in the person of his son, Jesus. He's the Logos. He's the Word, the Revealer, the Communicator. If you want to know what God is like, you find him in the person of Jesus Christ. Here are three important things to know about the Word. First, Jesus Christ is the eternal Word. That is seen in the first statement in the beginning was the Word. So when there was the beginning, the Word already existed. So it speaks of his pre-existence to creation. It speaks of his pre-existence to Bethlehem, and it speaks of what is called his eternality, that Jesus is eternal. These are some of the strongest and most powerful evidences for the deity of Jesus Christ. And there is a peril in this phrase, in this verse with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So this was the beginning. When everything began, and it's very amazing that scientists can't really explain the origin of things and where life really came from. Going back to the beginning, what we have the beginning of here is of time, matter, and space. All of this began, and when it began, Jesus was there. The inference here is that he was already there and that he is eternal. This is important because there are cults and false teachers that Jesus Christ is not the eternal God. That he's a created being, and that's sad. And they stumble over the term the Son of God, or the only begotten Son of God. Sometimes they teach that he was created by God. The Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus was first created as Michael, the archangel, and then morphed into Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, but they don't believe in eternality or that he was eternal. The Bible teaches that he was and is eternal. In the beginning was the Word. The second fact we have about Jesus in verse 1 is that he is personal being or God. He is a personal being or God. He is an eternal God. And he is God. It says, and the word was with God. That word with literally means face to face. We actually have a reference here to the persons in the Godhead. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. With God is a reference to God the Father. So Jesus, the eternal word, was with God the Father, who is also eternal. Again, the word with literally means to be face-to-face -face with. So if we are with someone, there's two of us, right? So we have God the Father and God the Son, and obviously God the Holy Spirit is present as well. He's not a force. He's not an animal. He's a person. He was with the Father. The third thing we have in verse 1 is that he is divine. He's the eternal word, and he's the divine word, all this in verse 1, and the word was God. In the Greek, it's even more powerful. It says, God was the word. I'm going to say that again. It says, God was the word. It doesn't say, the God. It just says, God was the word. In the Jehovah Witnesses' New World Translation, they deny the deity of Christ. And what they do is insert the Article A in here in the translation. But there's no basis for it from the Greek. And it reads, the word was a god, making Jesus a demigod or a lesser god or some kind of second-class god. There's no basis for that at all. And if you read this verse to a Jehovah's Witness when talking to them, they'll say, well, he 
a God. He's not the God. He, God, is eternal. He's the eternal God. And he is divine. Now looking at verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 2 is a summary of the verse 1. The same was in the beginning with God. The eternal word. This divine word was in the beginning with God. We need to be careful that we don't misinterpret that verse. It's foundational and very important. Moving on to verse 3 to the word in creation. Let's notice verse 3. All things, and this phrase all things means all things. That's profound. Were made by him. Who? The eternal divine word. The word was in the beginning with God the Father. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So everything we see created was created by Jesus. Now that's not to say that God the Father or God the Holy Spirit wasn't involved. But it came through God the Son. In Colossians it says, For him, for by him were all things created. By him all things consist or held together. He is the creator of all things. So he is God and he is the creator. He made all things. In verses 4 and 5, we move to the word and humanity. <coughs> it says, in him was life. There's one of the key words, and life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In listening to the scientists, <coughs> Excuse me. In listening to the scientists, it's been amazing. They're actually talking about the origin of life and how mystified they are by it and how difficult it is to try to understand the origin or the source of life. As we open the scripture, the theologians have been there for quite some time. Life and light. Light being necessary for life comes from God. He is God, the source of all light. He is the source of all light. Now, light has the idea of moral goodness and truth. Another contrast in John is darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. That symbolizes evil and ignorance. So light and life come from Jesus Christ. And it talks about his relationship to humanity. And the light shineth in the darkness. That's talking about sinful, fallen men living in darkness and separated from God. They cannot comprehend. They cannot understand. The light has come. So God sent the eternal word, the divine word, but man in their unregenerate state, their sinful darkness, can't comprehend it. They can't fathom or understand it. If we talk to a non-Christian who doesn't have the life of God in their soul, they don't understand spiritual things. If you're here today and you're not born again, you probably think, I can't understand anything the preacher is trying to say, basically. The idea is that life and light come from God. And we are, because of men's sin, in darkness and need to be born again. Now going to verses 6 to 13, to the words witness to the world through John the Baptist, it says, there was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He, that is John the Baptist, was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That cometh into the world is a reference to Jesus Christ, he came into the world and brought light to every man. But men rejected the light and chose to live in darkness. We have the light revealed in what's happening for us in verses 6 to 13 and John summarizing his whole gospel. Everything he talks about, the whole gospel is summarized that God came into the world. God brought the light and that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In verse 9, is light revealed? Verse 10, light rejected. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Again, he created the whole universe. 
and the world knew him not. Think about that. Now, in thinking about the galaxies, let's think about a clear night, a dark night. And you look up into the sky and the heavens, and you see all these galaxies, and you see the billions of stars, the vastness of space. Do we realize he spoke them in existence by his word? Do we think about that? Isn't that awesome when you go out there? And, there, and when you do that on a quiet night, there's such an awesome peace that comes with looking up into the sky and admiring God's handiwork. Light was rejected, though he was in the world, even though it was made by him, but the world knew him not. Notice verse 11. He came into his own, he came into his own, and his own received him not. Now here's an important distinction that we need to know in verse 11. When he came unto his own, some say his own people, his own town, but the first own here is his creation. He was the creator who became the creature. He was here among us. The second own is in verse 11, is a reference to his own Jewish people. Many of them had been looking for the Messiah, looking for the Messiah, but they did not recognize him. A challenge for us today. Do we recognize him? Verse 12. We have the light received, verse 9, light revealed, light rejected, verse 10 and 11, and then in verse 12, light received. But as many as received him, to them, those who received him, those who believe, and those who put their faith in Jesus, gave he power, means authority or the right, to become the son of or a better translation is children of God. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus came into his own created world. That's why he could walk on the water. And that's why he could turn water into wine instantly without the process of fermentation. He was the creator. Jesus was able to perform miracles that no one else had ever done and no one else could do. He was God in flesh, as we will see in verse 14. But as many as received him, there is a contrast, which is developed through John's gospel between unbelief and belief. Unbelief rejected him, and belief, those who received him. So we need to receive Jesus and trust Jesus. Also, we need to put our faith in Jesus. Have we received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The word received is actually the idea of faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Not your faith, but your salvation. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For salvation is a gift from God. The idea here is that we choose to believe or receive, and then he gives us the right to become the sons, children of God. When the reference is to the Son of God, singular, it's a reference to Jesus Christ, who is uniquely the only Son of God. We are the children of God. So the sons of God conveys the idea of our the sons of God conveys the idea of our standing, our position. The children of God conveys the idea that we have his nature and his character. 
we become partakers of the divine nature. God allows us to be partakers of his nature. We're born of God. Here in verse 13, which we're born not of blood, which means it's not a work of heredity. And we're going to learn that in John 3, when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus could not go back into his mother's womb and be reborn the second time. Nor the will of the flesh. It's not a natural ability. You can't regenerate yourself. It's a divine, sovereign work of God. Nor the will of man, but of God. So here's a clear statement. That salvation is of the Lord. You say, well, don't I have to believe in Jesus? Don't I have to receive Jesus? The answer is absolutely yes, you do. But God is the one who by his grace regenerates and gives you life. He convicts you. He draws you and then regenerates you and indwells you. He seals you and adopts you into his family. It's a divine work, as it says in the book of Jonah. Salvation is of the Lord. If you're a Christian, you have to give all the credit, all the glory to God. There's no boasting. Like, aren't I an awesome Christian? Aren't I amazing that I repented of my sins and I believed in Jesus Christ? No, absolutely no. We did the sinning. He, Jesus, did the saving. So what would we have to boast about? I was running away from him. He, Jesus, was running after me. And he apprehended me. He's a good shepherd who goes into the hills and finds that one lost sheep and brings it back to the fold, rejoicing. Your salvation is the will of God. It's not a human violation. It's not of human ability. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If there is anyone here that's never been saved or has been doubting that Jesus is the Son of God and now would like to accept him as your Lord and Savior, the altar is open. Or maybe we've been struggling with some issues of life and we feel distance from God. I encourage you to come and talk to the Lord and ask him for the wisdom, the peace, and the mercy and grace. Matthew 11 says this, Come unto me, all ye who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light.